So hello, everyone. Welcome to the second in four talks on our or five talks um, in our borderline personality disorder seminar series through um, psych sign region three. I'm excited to be introducing tonight Dr. Hirsch, who will be giving us a talk tonight on transference focused psychotherapy. Um, Dr. Hirsch has been trained in transference focused psychotherapy for treatment of personality disorders, um, as well as GPM or good psychiatric management for borderline personality disorder. Um, he teaches both TFP and GPM in the Columbia Psychiatry Residency Curriculum in both required and elective courses. Um, Dr. Hirsch also serves on the Scientific Advisory Board of the National Education Alliance for Borderline Personality Disorder, um, and he's the first author of the textbook Fundamentals of Transference-Focused Psychotherapy um, Applications in Psychiatric and Medical Settings, um, published in 2017 by Springer. Uh, Dr. Hirsch has received awards for teaching and program development from the Columbia University Psychiatry Residency and the Columbia Center for Psychoanalytic Training and Research. And so with that, I'm excited to hand it over to Dr. Hirsch. Great, thank you so much, Evan. Um, thank you so much for inviting me and for, it's wonderful to um, organize a program like this. Um, <clears throat> so we have a small group so we can, um, uh, Evan will help facilitate um, how we can, um, um, uh, have a, a, a group a discussion as we go along, uh, one that makes sense. Um, so what I'm going to offer today is an overview of transference-focused psychotherapy. Um, uh, here. So here is um, uh, my contact um, and disclosure. Um, so the goals of the presentation are to introduce you all to transference-focused psych transference psychotherapy as an evidence-based treatments for patients with borderline personality disorder. So that's one part. And it sounds like you're getting exposure to um, uh, a number of different empirically validated treatments for BPD. The second is to introduce transference-focused psychotherapy, E or extended, as a treatment for patients with personality disorders uh, uh, or personality disorder traits across the diagnostic continuum. I guess if you're in the second year and you've had some psychiatry lectures, maybe you know that there is a move towards a hybrid um, diagnostic um, dimensional approach to personality disorders in the appendix of the DSM-5. The next DSM will probably have this. Um, and TFPE um, is in some ways um, um, uh, addresses the fact that um, um, uh, interventions are needed for personality disorder pathology that don't fit neatly into um, a discrete category. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And then uh, provide some information for you about uh, training. Um, so that's the first thing we do. So I'm starting kind of at the end, but uh, there are a number of different ways to learn about TFP, should this be of interest to you, your second year medical students, um, but one of the things that's really great if you're interested in psychiatry and you're um, you know, maybe like third or fourth year medical students in particular is to try to go to the American Psychiatric Association annual meeting. It's a really worth going. Um, um, sometimes schools sponsor um, um, uh, students to go, and especially if it's in your hometown, I would really recommend it. And there, there are always TFP uh, lectures at the annual meeting of the American Psychiatric Association meeting. So um, Evan came um, before, was before medical school at McLean Hospital at the what used to be called the Borderline Personality Disorder Training Institute, now called the Gunderson Personality Disorder Training Institute. Um, McLean is one of the sites of the Harvard um, Medical School Department of Psychiatry, and um, they, they are um, always offering um, uh, uh, different kinds of um, opportunities to learn about the empirically validated treatments for personality disorders. The International Society of Transference Focused Psychotherapy is the, um, the group uh, uh, from many countries, and this is, a, I believe, a picture of Barcelona, Spain. And they pick really good places to have meetings. And it's a small meeting. So it's um, both an interesting place, plus it's a really personal meeting. And I can attest that Barcelona was a really exciting place um, to go to. 
And then transference focused psychotherapy or TFP New York is where I'm part of this group. That's also um, a source of um, uh, lots of teaching on Friday. They sponsored a day long um, uh, program on using transference focused psychotherapy for narcissistic personality disorder. Um, so um, in lots of ways, if, if this whets your appetite to learn more about TFP as we go forward. So let's start by talking about TFP. It's empirically validated for borderline personality disorder. Then we have TFPE, which does not have the same um, research base, but is an application of TFP principles for treatment across um, a continuum uh, of, of personality disorder pathology. And then we have applied TFP, which is for use in general psychiatry settings. And I should amend that because we also um, <clears throat> are using TFP um, in a um, uh, uh, small way in working with um, uh, medical subspecialties. So TFP was uh, empirically validated for BPD, but it's being used for other personality disorder uh, presentations and in uh, situations where the principles are used not for um, um, uh, psychotherapy, but for management of in the emergency room, inpatient, internist's office, consultation liaison um, uh, setting, that kind of thing. Okay, so these are some of the books on TFP. It gives you a little bit of a sense of the trajectory of the um, uh, disorder. It's, so in 2002, there was a primer of transference-focused psychotherapy. One of the authors is one of the most influential voices in American, really world psychiatry, Dr. Otto Kernberg, who's essentially a pioneer in this field, uh, along with John Gunderson. Um, and um, the, 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 um, the primer is an, is a, um, uh, was uh, published just as the research um, was um, being uh, done um, uh, on this disorder. The middle book, 2006, was um, uh, an initial manual. So an empirically validated treatment by definition is manualized. It's very, it was really um, pioneering to manualize a psychoanalytically informed treatment. And then the 2015 book that Dr. Yeomans is the first author on is really our most recent manual. Um, and that's kind of the Bible of TFP for BPD. What follows that is our book in 2016, which was a little bit of a different focus. It was less on psychotherapy and more on using these principles in different parts of the hospital. Um, so again, in the emergency room, the inpatient unit, the CL service, um, the general um, medical force. Um, Dr. Caligore in 2018, authored Psychodynamic Therapy for Personality Pathology, Treating Self and Interpersonal Functioning. This was a further application of TFP principles beyond BPD to different and higher level personality pathology in a way that fits with the evolution of the DSM-5 um, thinking of, of the nosology of personality disorders. And finally, just um, this year, our colleagues, um, have published Treating Pathological Narcissism with Transference-Focused Psychotherapy. Um, so it gives you some idea of these books about the trajectory of the field um, and the um, richness of the literature um, on TFP. So what is the evidence for this evidence-based uh, treatment? So TFP was um, compared with schema-focused therapy, which is more popular in Europe. It's probably not somebody I probably Evan wasn't able to get someone to lecture on schema focused therapy because there are not that many people who do it. Or maybe you were. Um, um, but both interventions in this three year, this is an RCT, both um, interventions in this three year study showed reduction in all of the BPD symptoms, increase in quality of life, and associated changes in personality features. Um, <clears throat> so, in some ways, um, there were some things where um, uh, schema focused therapy was superior, it had a lower attrition rate, um, but not an improved quality of life. So that was one study. The following year, uh, DBT and TFP were compared, right? So DBT, as you know, is basically the gold standard for treating personality disorder pathology. 
It's um, the most widely used. It has the, the greatest um, uh, accumulation of research. And this was a DBT, DBT versus TFP versus supportive um, treatment by um, local experts. And all three interventions showed significant positive change in patients' depression, anxiety, global functioning, and social adjustment over one year of treatment. Only TFP was predictive of a decrease in irritability. Both were associated with a decrease in suicidality. TFP and supportive treatment were also associated with reduced anger and impulsivity. And only TFP showed a significant improvement in reflective functioning, which is the capacity to stand outside yourself, observe yourself, observe your behavior. So this was a landmark study. It, it calls into question um, uh, um, a, um, uh, a theme, which is uh, do, do all of these treatments work in a similar way? When you do head to head, there's a reason why um, you know, DBT and TFP seem to be comparable. And it's still a, a question that's being explored, like what works in in psychotherapy for borderline personality disorder and how do we assign certain patients to certain treatments. Oops. And then um, this 2010 study by colleagues in Europe was TFP versus local experts, both um, patients in both groups, um, uh, but TFP in particular had lower dropouts, significantly fewer suicide attempts, inpatient admissions, and BPD symptoms and greater improvement in personality organization and psychosocial function. So these are the RCTs that allow uh, TFP to be described as an empirically validated treatment. This is Dr. Otto Kernberg. He's an internationally known psychiatrist and psychoanalyst, still working, still lecturing, um, who's um, devoted a lot of his life to work on um, assessing and treating borderline personality disorder. But the group, um, the, the picture on the right is just a small group of a number of uh, clinicians all around the world who are um, um, in, involved in this treatment. And I have to say um, that one of the things that's really been fun for me um, is um, having uh, colleagues all over the world who are interested in the same thing. And it really has been broadening all over the country and all over the world. It's really exciting, really broadening. Um, I feel very appreciative of that. So let's talk about the basics of TFP. It's a psychoanalytic um, psychotherapy informed by object relations theory. It's a reworking of standard psychoanalytic psychotherapy to treat more impaired patients. So as you probably know, psychoanalysis dominated American psychiatry up until the mid, uh, mid, middle part of the last century, and certainly dominated the treatment of patients with personality disorders probably through the 1960s. Um, but in some ways, it has receded as cognitive behavioral therapies um, have emerged. TFP is an attempt to mine and to use um, uh, elements of psychoanalytic theory and practice, but adapt it for borderline patients um, in contemporary times. Um, it's empirically validated, it's manualized. Psychoanalysis isn't manualized, right? It's, it's rare that, that, that it's, um, there is another psychoanalytic psychotherapy for BPD called mentalization-based treatment. Maybe Evan, you have a speaker from MBT coming? So that was also manualized, but manualization is essentially the gold standard at this point. Um, TFP uh, as, an, as an individual psychotherapy is twice weekly, one to three years. So it's labor intensive and can be expensive. Um, but re recall that um, DBT is also a twice weekly treatment as you would know mentalization based uh, therapy is. And for border, borderline personality disorder at a certain level um, um, is thought to require relatively intensive treatment. And it's anchored by something called the structural interview and in the negotiation and maintenance of the treatment frame. The structural interview basically means we're trying to gauge when we're assessing a patient with personality disorder, pathology, how is the patient sick and how sick is the patient? How impaired is the patient? So what is the quality of the personality disorder symptoms? What category does it fit in? And what is the severity of illness? 
how impaired is the patient? And most of the research points to the fact that severity of illness is the best prognostic indicator. And it also informs treatment choice. So the structural interview, which was developed by Dr. Kernberg in the 1980s, is a way of looking at patients um, in an assessment process beyond the um, psychiatric interview, which I think you probably all have been exposed to in your, um, in your um, psychiatry. Okay. And we have something called a treatment frame, which is essentially an explicitly defined setup for the treatment, and in particular, an outlining of the responsibilities of both the therapist and the patient. And this is done at the outset. So this distinguishes TFP, the way that we assess patients and how we structure the treatment. Okay. Um, I'm happy to take questions, if, uh, even if people want to, that's okay with me. I don't know, it's up to, it's up to the group. Yeah, if so, anyone has any questions, please feel free to, to ask them at this time. Okay. So, so um, what, what is TFP? What, what it's not? It's not psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis. It doesn't use the couch. It's never more than twice a week. It's not an unstructured psychodynamic treatment. It focuses on specific treatment goals, not just self-understanding. It's not supportive uh, psychotherapy. It doesn't involve advice, guidance, unless there's specifically a reason to deviate from what we call technical neutrality. It's not cognitive behavioral therapy. It aims for a change in personality, not just a change in behaviors. So how does it unfold? TFP is, uh, I think, notable for the fact that it has a, a, a lot of um, a very specific form. It's not something where somebody calls you on Monday and you start TFP on Tuesday. It unfolds in a very specific and deliberate way. The first thing we do is the assessment process. We've talked about this. Then we share the clinician's diagnostic impression with the patient. This, I think, is, um, um, well, let me say two things. Number one, uh, all the empirically validated treatments for borderline personality disorder include a sharing of the clinician's diagnosis. Um, I don't know if that is, seems odd to, this, to people listening, but this is considered um, uh, an essential part of all the empirically validated treatments. And this is something new. When you think about it, until relatively recently, maybe 20 years ago, personality disorder diagnoses were not routinely shared with patients. And there's a history in medicine, um, as you probably know, of withholding medical diagnoses from patients. Up until the 1950s and 60s, many patients weren't told of their cancer diagnosis. Through the 60s and 70s, many schizophrenia spectrum patients were not told their diagnosis. And really in the 80s and 90s, many patients with borderline personality disorder were not told their diagnosis. Complicated question, complicated reasons, um, but, but all of the empirically validated treatments, including TFP, incorporate sharing the diagnosis for a lot of really good specific reasons. Um, TFP is very anchored to a patient's personal goals and in particular personal goals in four important spheres, work, dating and romance, recreation, um, and um, uh, um, friends. So we don't, we don't just start treatment without a very clear sense of where we're going. Um, and we frame those as, as personal goals. And that's something that's discussed at the outset of the treatment. Um, close to 100% of the time, we contract, contact prior treaters for history. This helps us put our treatment um, frame or treatment agreement together because we try to figure out what failed in prior treatments um, so that we can flag that as we uh, start a new treatment. As you probably know, patients with personality disorders in general have very high dropout rates in treatment. So contacting prior treaters is considered standard of care. It's actually um, more generally in psychiatry considered standard of care. 
Um, and um, there are there is has been litigation on this, and courts have ruled that um, it is incumbent on treaters to take us assessing a new patient to get pertinent information from prior treaters. This is um, um, something that we fold into the TFP. We have a family meeting. If the patient is in any way dependent on the um, a family member. So this is also something that's unusual in psychodynamic psychotherapy, but we involve the family for a whole bunch of different ways, reasons. And then we have what's called a contracting phase, which is essentially developing a treatment agreement that's been um, um, quite detailed from the start before the psychotherapy even starts. All of this is required before the psychotherapy begins. So you can probably see that transference-focused psychotherapy isn't something that you do in a crisis situation. Um, you can do crisis management while you negotiate these steps, but we touch all of these bases before getting started with the treatment. Okay, so these are two different graphics that try to capture standard interviewing. On the left is this decision tree. If you're using DSM nosologic categories, you're going to ask a question and then um, uh, in a decision tree way, go on to a next set of questions. The structural interview is different. This is a very complicated slide, but it tries to capture the circular nature. You're using your intuition to go through all the different symptoms that are brought to your attention. And you're going to dig down, um, uh, informed by your own um, uh, sense of what's important uh, on a particular area. So some of these are familiar to you from a standard psychiatric interview, like sensorium, memory, assessing intelligence. Some of these are, relate specifically to the structural interview, which is trying to understand what's underneath the personality disorder pathology. And we'll go into that in detail. But it just gives you a feeling that um, rather than a decision tree, step one, you ask questions, go to step two, you're constantly circling uh, in your interviewing to um, um, clarify areas that are confusing or in some ways nebulous to you. Okay. I think of transference-focused psychotherapy because it was developed mostly by psychiatrists as fitting very well for those of us who have medical training. In the TFP, we wear three hats in succession, our physician hat, our psychiatrist hat, and our psychodynamic psychotherapist hat. This, I think, is one of the things that you'll, as you, as you um, uh, continue in your studies, you'll start to, to um, as particularly if you choose to, if, if you do a psychiatric clerkship or an elective or psychiatric training, you'll start to appreciate that a lot of the people who's, with whom you're crossing paths don't necessarily have a medical training. Some won't even have a psychiatric training. And you'll realize that your perspective on assessing patients is informed by this. So for example, if a patient's, um, let's say confused, you're going to, as a physician, want to make sure that this is not a delirium and you're going to assess that. If a patient, um, um, or, or if you feel like there's a psychiatric um, uh, component, say the patient is in a mixed state, you use your psychiatrist hat. You do all those things before you offer a psychodynamic psychotherapy. And that's Sigmund Freud for there to you standing in for psychodynamic psychotherapy, okay? Okay, um, with personality disorder patients, we're very focused on what we call the three channels of communication. It's central to both the assessment process and the treatment once it begins. In some ways, we care, we care about what the patient says, but we care less about what the patient says than other therapies do. We're very focused on how the patient behaves and how the therapist feels, or what we call countertransference. The thinking is that patients with personality disorder pathology, many of them have real difficulty 
communicating their internal experience in words, and they do so either in behavior or in some ways that register to you as the treater. But think about that, um, whether you've had that in, with patients um, you've already seen, whether how you felt or how the patient behaves has been equally or maybe more helpful in the assessment process than what the patient says. We call that the three channels of communication. The goals of the structural interview are to make diagnoses based on standard DSM-5 nosologic categories. We're still in a categorical system now. We also are interested in severity of illness. How impaired is this patient in the key areas of his or her life? Um, this is, uh, again, consistent with, with what is called the AMPD, or the Alternative Model for Personality Disorders, which is in the appendix of DSM-5, and will probably be the new way of assessing personality disorders in the next iteration of the DSM. Um, these questions, what's the category, what's the severity of illness, cue us about prognosis and likely requirements for a treatment frame, which means essentially the more impaired the patient, the more rigorously put together a treatment agreement is. Um, and it informs recommended recommendations for treatment. Not every patient is a category as a candidate for TFP. And part of our job isn't, to, we're not recruiting patients, we're assessing them and then making recommendations informed by the clinical information we um, gather. Okay, this is a mnemonic device. You're medical students, so you like mnemonic devices. This is a mnemonic device that I and my colleagues came up with to capture um, what we do in the structural interview. We, we, we assess reality testing. Um, with psychotic or non-psychotic processes. Patients with primary psychotic processes would not be candidates for this treatment. Dr. Kernberg has um, been central in the identification and the, um, and the um, uh, emphasis on addressing aggression, self-directed aggression and other directed aggression in borderline personality disorder. So for example, we'll be interested in something like non-suicidal self-injurious behavior, which we would see as a reflection of self-directed aggression. Defensive operations are essentially describing coping strategies. How do patients cope? Do they cope in a mature way and they're what we call higher level defenses, or they, do they cope in what we call more primitive and our shorthand is splitting-based defenses? Identity consolidation versus identity diffusion. How stable is the patient's sense of identity? Friends, interests, affiliations, or is the patient, um, um, patient's history marked by a lack of clarity about what, uh, about what sustains the patient? By object relations, we just mean who are the people in the patient's life? And how do they treat the people? What is the quality of the relationship? And finally, the S in radios is what we call super ego vulnerabilities. Does anyone know what the super ego is? Can anyone volunteer? Anyone want to put it in the chat or? I think it's sort of kind of what others' expectations of you are usually kind of caregivers or morals that influence the ego. Uh, Giselle, I recognize your name because <laughs> I reviewed your paper, right? Yes, I know. Um, I saw in one of the emails um, at my med school that you were giving this talk. So I, oh, I was just telling great. Evan, I need to drop in. Yeah. Okay, great. Nice to meet you. Okay, so you're the ringer. Okay, got it. Um, right, right. So super ego can be too strict, too harsh, um, too high, high, most medical students, for example, have relatively strict or harsh superegos. They demand a lot of themselves. Or a superego can be lax, and that could be um, 
um, marked by some version of lying, cheating, or stealing. We're very interested in those things when interviewing patients with personality disorder pathology, actually all patients. These are a history of lying, cheating, or stealing. Because lying, cheating, or stealing um, to a significant extent is a negative prognostic indicator. Okay. This is a very complicated slide, but it's a very valuable slide. What it, attends, what it attempts to do is to capture severity. So you can see, oh, I should be able to do this. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know exactly, oops. Um, um, so severity is on the right-hand side. Uh, mild severity would be what we call neurotically organized patients. Extremely severe patients would be what we call psychotic level of personality organization. In the middle, you can see the square of borderline personality disorder. We consider that a fairly uh, severe presentation of personality disorder pathology. This particular slide includes all of the DSM-5 categories, but it also has some categories that used to be in the DSM that were no longer included, and some ways of thinking about patients from um, um, the psychoanalytic literature. Of note to those of you who are um, still medical students is on the lower left, what's called hypochondriacal. We probably would, could um, replace that with um, somatizing patients, patients with prominent physical symptoms. And we often consider that a marker for significant um, personality disorder pathology. Okay. Complicated slide, but it's basically still get, get, getting at the same issues. How severe is the patient's impairment? What subcategory are we thinking? And the reason it's important for a bunch of different reasons because not every borderline patient is the same. Some are better organized, higher functioning. Some are on the cusp of treatability. So we call this group, the main, this, this group, borderline personality organization. And it, it encompasses BPD as well as the, some other personality disorder diagnoses. I mentioned that. These are what we consider the BPO criteria, nonspecific ego weakness, disturbed interpersonal relations, difficulties with commitment to love and work, some degree of pathology in sexual relations and superego pathology. So these are subtypes of borderline personality organization presentations. They're all familiar to you, or some are familiar to you from DSM, some are not. So why do we share the diagnostic impression? As I said, it's part of um, all the evidence-based treatments for BPD. It allows patients and families to make informed decisions about treatment. I don't know if any of the lecturers thus far has um, mentioned to you an organization called the National Education Alliance for Borderline Personality Dis Disorder. It's an extremely um, important uh, advocacy organization for patients and families. It has, I think, the single largest collection of uh, materials related to BPD. Um, and of course, if a patient doesn't know he or she has BPD, they're not gonna be able to access important information. Um, when a patient knows a diagnosis, it helps to minimize iatrog comp iatrogenic complications of ignoring or minimizing the contribution of personality disorder pathology. Can anybody guess at what an iatric complication of minimizing or ignoring BPD might be? Any, anybody want to make a, make a suggestion? So what, would, what, would, what might physicians do if they don't either recognize or talk with borderline patients about their diagnosis? What could they do that would adversely affect the borderline patient's treatment? Any ideas? Okay, so, so the first thing that comes to mind, and you will see this when you go to the psychiatry wards, <clears throat> uh, 
no medications are approved by the FDA for treating borderline personality disorder. But patients with borderline personality disorder um, take a lot of medication. And a lot of those medications have side effects. And if you're not making the diagnosis and or sharing the diagnosis with the patient, it's very possible for a patient to end up taking three, four, five, six medications with drug-drug interactions and very significant side effects. And that would be a very familiar iatrogenic complication. Okay, so also sharing the diagnosis, you know, it allows you to talk to the patient about what is going to unfold. Okay, why well, have a family meeting? You get parallel information, it's very valuable. You give the patients psychoeducation, right? Part of your job is to educate the family members about the disorder. You address what we call splitting between the family and treaters. Does anyone have a, a, a sense of what, the, what, what I mean by splitting here? Anyone familiar with that term? I think in, in my limited understanding of the sure. concept, it's, um, it's really viewing objects, external objects, as oscillating between different valences, like good or bad, exactly. right or wrong. Exactly. So you could have, right, you have the family meeting because the patient might be saying, I have this terrible doctor, or the doctor might be saying, I have this terrible family, and you don't really know, right? And this gives you a chance to, to address it early on. Uh, because borderline pathology is marked by, uh, as um, was just mentioned, uh, alternating idealization and devaluation, seeing all positive, all negative, okay? Um, uh, the meeting addresses what we call omnipotent control of the patient's management of information. You'll see this uh, when you um, start to um, interview patients in the ER, patients who won't give you permission to speak to family or their doctors or something like that. It's a little confusing, right? You would think that someone would be happy if you offered that, but, um, but that's a, a primitive defense often seen in the borderline personality disorder patients. So we have the family meeting and also it addresses the denial of a patient's dependence on family. Sometimes it's financial dependence or emotional dependence. And it's a very useful risk management tool. Risk management means uh, essentially avoiding or protecting yourself from adverse events, malpractice. And um, it's important to have a way of proceeding with BPD patients that protects you as a clinician. Okay, contracting, the goal is to create an environment where there's a feeling of safety for both the patient and the therapist. Um, gives a therapist a preview of the likely what we call dominant object relations paradigms. Is the patient going to be very idealizing and agreeable or paranoid and angry? We want to get that out up front. And these are all the different things we have in our treatment contract. We do not treat, we do not offer exploratory psychotherapy to patients who are not involved in a meaningful activity either work for money, volunteer work, or studies. We do not do that. So a patient who's sitting at home watching TV smoking pot, we do not offer an exploratory psychotherapy. Um, it really does distinguish TFP from other treatments. There are also lots of other different elements of the treatment agreement, but the mainstay is the meaningful activity requirement. And it's basically, um, saying, we don't think you're going to be able to benefit from treatment unless you're in some ways out in the real world. Some people won't tolerate that, but it is a requirement for this particular treatment. Okay, what do we do when the treatment begins? The first thing we do is tolerate the confusion. Patients with borderline personality disorder can be very um, confusing. You might try to structure what they say, but they're, they're invoking people, telling you stories. It really can be very complicated. We try to identify the, what they say that has the 
affective dominance. What's the strongest feeling? We try to put into words what we call naming the actors, basically the, the, the story that's emerging, something like, I'm a victim, my boss is treating me badly, or uh, I'm um, uh, really beautiful, this guy who wants to date me is a loser. We try to capture what the dominant object relations diet. We also monitor for what we call role reversals. We tend to think that many patients who experience themselves as victims, right, can themselves be victimizing, right? It's not in their awareness. We're not being critical, but we're trying to bring to their attention uh, the full, a, full, a greater sense of what goes on for them. Uh, we maintain technical neutrality. We don't tell patients what to do except in certain circumstances. And we're always attending to the treatment frame. We're asking, did you go to work today? Did you make 20 hours this past week? Um, that's just one of the different aspects of the frame we attend to. This is the what we call the building block of TFP. It's what's called an object relations dyad. It basically just means how the patient feels about him or herself how the patient feels about an other person, including the therapist, and what is the associated feeling. We're always orienting ourselves to this dyad. This is a cornerstone of object relations theory. Naming the actors we talked about could be, gee, you seem angry, the patient seems angry, because it's as if you're suffering and, uh, and you see me, the therapist, or the emergency room doctor as indifferent to you. That is a way we try to, we don't argue with patients, we just try to put into words what we observe uh, and what we imagine they are, what's going on for them. If that doesn't sound right to them, that's fine. That's our first step in a dialogue. Now the, the, um, the um, slides get a little complicated, but I'm gonna go through them pretty quickly. So most patients with borderline personality disorder <clears throat> on the surface is an experience of fear, sometimes suspicion, sometimes hate. Sometimes it's more idealizing that that's usually short-lived. And the object relations dyad is a victim persecutor dyad. You're making me wait in the emergency room. I'm not being treated well. And then we, we watch for what we call role reversals where the patient, not in the patient's awareness, can act as a persecutor. And you're worried like the patient, you know, very common in BPDs, a patient just will say, I don't know if I can stay safe after this appointment. Who knows? I don't know if I'll, you know, I walk over the bridge on my way home. I don't know if I can stay safe, right? That is a that is the patient in a persecutor role and you as therapist as victim, but it's not in the patient's awareness. Um, so here, this just kind of captures some of this um, oscillation. Um, and then what we really try to get at is over time is what we think is underneath the patient's surface um, uh, experience of self and you or others infused by fear, suspicion, and hate, which is a wish for connection, maybe even an ideal connection. Um, this is a, a, the longer term goal to get at the patient, what the patient is, what we call defending against, really feels, but doesn't feel he or she can communicate. It's a little complicated, these slides, so I apologize. So what do we do when the treatment begins? Um, like all psychodynamic psychotherapists, a lot of what we do is just clarification or asking for more information about things that aren't clear. Also, what we do is something called confrontation, not in the standard use of the word confrontation. We're not, it's not adversarial, but we're bringing to the patient's attention any material. Sometimes it's something they say, sometimes it's a way they behave that's somehow contradictory or discrepant. An interpretation, which is a hallmark of psychoana psychoanalysis, is a hypothesis about motivation. We tend to reserve that until after we've done lots of clarification and confrontation. What happens over time? We hope that the patient can move from having extreme positive and negative experience of self and others to something more integrated. We're hoping for an increased capacity for self-reflection 
And you may remember this, one of the uh, studies, the RCTs show that that was the case with TFP. We focus on positive changes in the patient's life outside of treatment, romance, work, friends, hobbies, and what we call a move from the paranoid position to the depressive position. That's a little jargony, but it's basically saying, seeing pay themselves and other people in kind of caricatured ways, all black, all white, to something more nuanced and, um, um, yeah. So in summary, TFP is an evidence-based treatment for BPD. It's informed by psychoanalytic object relations theory with significant adjustments made specifically for treating patients with moderate to severe personality disorder pathology. It has as its primary goal, the integration of elements that are often split off from the patient's awareness. Like for example, a borderline patient may not know that he or she can be experienced by others as victimizing or persecutorial. But over time, the, the, the goal would be to have that integrated so the patient can recognize that. And TFP has a very specific order involving assessment, diagnosis, sharing, contact with prior treaters, family meeting, and extended contracting. And finally, it stresses the therapist's neutral stance, avoiding taking a side in the patient's internal conflict. Um, it stresses the three channels of communication, particularly how the patient behaves and how the therapist feels, the therapist countertransference, not just what the patient says. It's focused on exploration of dyads, starting with naming the actors, role reversals, and eventually a dyad defending against another dyad. TFPE extends the treatment for patients with BPD to patients with other personality disorder or personality disorder traits, including higher functioning patients. And that is the presentation. So I think we did well with time. And um, uh, I will um, uh, now um, uh, answer questions, please. Thank you so much. Dr. Hi, um, thank you so oh, much sorry. for giving. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead, Heyman. Go ahead. Oh, thanks, Evan. Um, thank you so much for giving the talk. Um, I was just wondering if you could explain a little bit more about um, why meaningful engagement outside of therapy is required. Is like required for it. Like, is this um, like if somebody is holding a job or is pursuing studies, does that make for a better prognostic for their engagement in therapy? So, so I'll be, maybe what I'm going to say is kind of glib, so I apologize, but in a way, one of the, one of my thoughts is what are you going to talk about in a twice weekly exploratory therapy, if somebody's not involved in the world in some important fundamental way. So you're at, the answer is yes, you have material, and you have material that's central to the patient's underlying problem. How do, how do they feel about themselves? How do they interact with others? That doesn't work if a patient's home by him or herself. Does that make sense? It gives you content. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Sure. It, 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 one other thing. It also, it also is a implicit communication that you think the patient can do better. Right? It's a, it's a way of connecting with the patient's healthier side. They, they may not like it, they may complain, they hate Starbucks, they hate the customers, but you're engaging with the patient's more, more um, uh, positive uh, side, okay? Other questions? Um, I have a question, Dr. Hirsch. Um, um, it's just a follow-up. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Sure, um, yeah, so my question is, um, what if the patient has a um, good social support? Um, um, in that case, uh, do you consider this as a meaningful involvement or engagement? Thank you. Yes, yeah. I mean, what if the patient has a lot of friends but doesn't work, doesn't go to school, you know, doesn't have any structure, is that what you mean? Exactly, yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah, it would, it would still be, it would be a better prognosis patient, right? The, the research suggests that 
borderline patients with more populated lives do better than those borderline patients with impoverished social lives. But uh, if the meaningful activity requirement would hold, that's correct. Thank you. It makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Sure. Anything else? Um, I also had um, another question. Um, I just I just want to make sure that I, I'm not like hogging the floor. Um, but I, I was just wondering, for, so especially for counter transference, how do you kind of make sure that the feelings that a patient is engendering in you is not from like an, in your own internal bias? Well, it, it is. Right, part of part of counter transference does reflect your own internal bias. Right, it, it, it can't help but doing that. You're 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 human, um, uh, but it's not just your own internal your uh, your own bias. Um, so so um, I think one of the things that we um, uh, have in place. Because we have a very clear structure in place, if for whatever reason we're moved to deviate from what is expected, that will cue us to look at our countertransference so that we can try to understand what's happening that might be somehow undermine the treatment. So, so, does that make sense? Should I give you an example or something? Yeah, I think an example would be very helpful. Okay. So, um, let's say we, um, uh, we have an agreement that a patient, um, uh, come on time to sessions. This is actually a big, big deal with borderline patients. And that would be a, a, a central part of the treatment, the treatment contract. They come on time, but you let the patient come five or 10 minutes late and you don't comment about it. Say, because maybe the patient has a prominent family member and you don't wanna you know, get the patient mad. Um, you, that is part of your counter-transference. You're deviating from the agreement. That will cue you to look at what's going on that will cause you to deviate from your standard practice. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes more sense, thank you. Sure. I have a question. Um, thank you so much for this presentation. It's super fascinating. Um, I And correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that sometimes, especially with um, sort of cluster B personality disorders, uh, patients can be somewhat of a combination between disorders, and that can make both diagnosis and treatment more difficult. Say, for example, you had a patient in that scenario where maybe they were a combination between BPD and narcissistic. How does that impact your approach to treatment? It's a great question. Um, so I'm involved with a study now um, at, Colum at Cornell. Um, and most of the patients we see have um, prominent co-occurring narcissistic pathology. Um, it is, it is, it's complicated um, for all, in a lot of different ways. Um, <clears throat> and I would say we have had to adapt TFP um, to address co-occurring narcissistic pathology, but it's not just um, narcissistic pathology. Antisocial pathology is prominent, sometimes dependent. Um, rare occasions, schizotypal. Um, but I would say that um, like co-occurring conditions, uh, personality disorders co-occurring is, um, is not the exception, but it's the rule. Does that make sense? I guess I didn't, did I answer your question? Yeah, and then, and then so like, how does that impact your approach to treatment then? Would you still think that something like this would work or would you kind of have to pivot? So, right, so, so we, we don't have, we don't have, um, studies on TFP for NPD, but there are no empirically validated studies on treating NPD. So we use what we have um, and we do make adjustments with more of a focus on 
self-esteem modulation um, when there's when the patient has co-occurring conditions, but most borderline patients have self-esteem challenges. Um, so I, I don't have a great answer for you, except that um, it's a it's a um, a key part of current discussions of, of um, in our research group, um, and particularly the. Um, uh, when there's co-occurring NPD and BPD. Thank you. Are we almost out of time? We're at the hour, so we could wrap up now, but if anyone has any questions, um, please oh, can... ask them. I, don't, sure. I want to be mindful of your time too, Dr. Hirsch. Sure, sure. G Giselle, before we stop, do you want to tell the group about your project? Sure. So um, I'm a medical student now, but um, I also work in the Department of Psychiatry at Wall Cornell, which is very well known for its transference focused um, group. Uh, including Dr. Hirsch and um, our team at Cornell was exploring a study that would examine how emergency medicine physicians can manage their countertransference with patients who present to the ED specifically um, with a dual diagnosis of borderline personality disorder and substance use complications um, or problematic substance use. And so uh, myself and one of the training analysts at Columbia Analytic Center um, led a training for the EM residents and physicians. And it kind of laid the foundation of object relations that Dr. Hirsch um, discussed a bit. But we were surprised that the EM faculty really enjoyed the lecture. <laughs> Even though it kind of incorporated a lot of psychodynamic theory, there certainly seems to be a need for concepts um, and applications of theories and, and treatment modalities like TFP um, in an extended way uh, across medical specialties, which I'm most interested in. And so Dr. Hirsch helped us out with that project and we were very thankful uh, for his expertise on that. Thank you. Yeah. So it was a great, is, a, is a, a great paper, very exciting, yeah. Okay. So yeah, okay. If there, are, if there are no other questions, then um, if I could ask a quick question, just because- Sure, please, please. In, I think just looking forward at the rest of our seminar series, we have a talk on DBT and we have another talk on GTM. So, so sorry for everyone, that's um, dialectical behavior therapy and then good psychiatric management for borderline personality disorder. And right. Dr. Hirsch, I know that you have extensive experience in at least two of those. Yes. Um, so I guess I was wondering, what is the role of TFP in the treatment landscape for borderline personality disorder? I think especially in light of the kind of more, the, the greater intensity of TFP relative to the other treatment modalities, would you maybe based on severity um, reserve TFP for the more severe presentations or how, how, how does it- so the, it the other Right, so it's, um, so um, it hasn't been, it, it, it's um, not been widely disseminated in the way that DBT has. In Western Europe, it actually has been, which is really interesting. In Western Europe, they have DBT, I mean, TFP, partial hospital programs, TFP inpatient units, they have TFP for forensic patients. We don't have anything like that in this country. Um, I think naturally what has happened over time is that many patients who um, uh, have been through DBT and gotten better but not would like to continue uh, treatment will then migrate to TFP. So it's a different focus. Um, uh, as per Colleen's is a question, very interesting question. Many narcissistic patients find DBT to be too elementary and they will select um, TFP, which may or may not be a good thing, but they, thought they find um, DBT to be too by the book or something like that. So there's also a self-selection component. 
hope that answers your question. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, if there are no other questions, I'd like to thank you so much, Dr. Hirsch, for giving sure. this time for us tonight and for engaging with all of our questions. I, I really enjoyed this, and I think I hope we all learned a lot about PFP and treatment of borderline personality disorder. Great. Well, I really enjoyed uh, uh, participating and, and really appreciated your questions. Okay. Good luck. All right. Take care. Thank you so much. Sure. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.